The Everything Sequel Podcast is brought to you by Brew Bar and Tua T Fitness. The Everything Sequel Podcast contains explicit language, and I will not go to my room. Bye. My name is Michael Schantz of the How Dare You Awards. Joining me, of course, the man, the myth, the legend, the British Bulldog. That's your boxing name. Tom Stewart of Lonesome Whistle Productions. Give it to me. Maybe I'll take you upstairs and violate you like a parking meter. Oh, <laughs> boy, do I have a big fat star next to that line. Inappropriate for the character to be said to his <laughs> wife yes. in front of his child. Yes. One of them. It's all bad. Symptomatic of how. The characters in this movie lose their essence the more we try to return to their origins. Exactly. The biggest sin of this movie. Oh, hey, slow down. <laughs> this is a this is a this is a sinful Replete movie. Complete with sinful. And we just started shit. talking about it. <laughs> That's the All original right, well, sin. There's some yeah. there's some venal stuff in there too. All right, ladies and gentlemen, we are talking about Rocky V. Because we have to. Because we have no choice. <laughs> it's a 1990 in film <laughs> directed once again by John G. Avildsen. We haven't talked about him yet other than in passing. No. Uh, but he directed the original Rocky and he is back to bring Rocky to form and uh, failed miserably. He's back this to punish has... Rocky, basically. Yeah. <laughs> flagellate him for an hour and 45 minutes. Well, now we really are in the uh, land of diminishing returns. Uh, you know, everywhere. 30% on Rotten Tomatoes, a budget of $42 million, an opening weekend of only $14 million. In the USA, did not make its money back, $40.9 million, but did make one nineteen point nine in the world. Uh, we've talked about this before. Stallone himself rates this movie zero out of ten. Wow. Well, I mean, in <laughs> in the in the aforementioned pre Ultimate Director's cuts of Rocky versus Drago interview, his his only reference to Rocky Five was to say Rocky Five doesn't work, and he mm -hmm. did not elaborate. So zero seems to correspond with that. I think he's probably still would rate it the same. He says he made it completely out of greed. Which is fascinating, given what the story's about. I know, exactly. <laughs> it's about him backsliding into poverty. <laughs> maybe maybe the writing was on the wall, on screen. <laughs> I'll tell you. Um, I don't even know where to start with this movie. Do you know, do you know, what, do you know how bad this movie is? Even the United <laughs> Artists logo is wobbly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> it's the wobbliest fucking logo I've ever seen. Someone temper down that film, please. <laughs> oh, that's so good. Well, we mentioned uh, this movie is directed by John G. Avildsen, who directed the original movie. And if you don't know, he also has done uh, all three Karate Kid movies. Mm -hmm. Uh, Lean on Me, The Power of One, and Eight Seconds, the Luke Perry Riding Bulls movie. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. All right. <laughs> you didn't see that one? I, no. <laughs> no, I've never seen that collection of of uh, of actors, themes, and media <laughs> before. No. <laughs> Uh, all right. Well, you know, <laughs> man. All right. As this movie starts, we're we're gonna do what we always do, right? We're gonna see a bit of the last fight. Oh, a bit more than a bit. Yeah. <laughs> Which is good because it's the only real boxing in the movie. Yeah. It's so. It's like I was just gonna say. It begins on a high point because we get to see a bit of Rocky. We get to see quite a lot of Rocky Four. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> it's an implied pleasure of these movies 
is that, that if you preferred the previous one, you're always going to be happy for like a few minutes. I, I have a note here that says, showing all of round one. Hmm. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a very confusing title sequence. But it's also strange because like it's all out of order too. Right. Um, it's how Abelson would have fucking done it, probably. Yeah, I guess. That's the sense I get. So it's, mm, it's interesting because more than any other movie, this recap, this lengthy recap, Gives the impression that, that this movie is going to pick up the story as well as, as the, as you know, just recapping what happened. Right. I mean, like we see a so lot of the, Drago as if he is in any way a character in this movie. Right. And this this movie's narrative starts the second that fight's done. <laughs> well, first of first, I mean, my confusion about this title sequence. You've just said it, it's it's out of order. So that's already confusing. That's strange and dumb. It starts as eye dense <laughs> for the characters, as if it was a TV show. Then it mm -hmm. runs out of characters who are coming back. Burgess Meredith is listed in the credits, so you're immediately going, well, I know for a fact he's dead. So what the so fuck? So what the fuck? <laughs> and there's so much Drago, you're like, yeah, but Drago's not in this movie. Stop showing me Drago. You're just reminding me of what we don't have. Of what's not going to be present. Um, and then the other big red flag is that this movie is 15 minutes longer than, yeah. than the previous movie, which as we've said before, it's not a good, it, it's only, it's a bad sign only in this context of the series. Only in this series. <laughs> um, Usually when movies get shorter, uh, in sequel -dom, you're, you're dropping off in quality. Yeah. We in Rocky Three and Rocky Four, you have a certain '80s thing that's happening yeah. that um, actually works for those movies. Right. And then all of a sudden, we're trying to go back to basics. Boy, are we! And uh, it just doesn't work on every level. There were there were like two or three really good choices at the beginning of Rocky Three. I'm going to talk about two or three fatal mistakes. That <laughs> yes, please go ahead. This movie, and uh, this is before we even get into the plot. Um, is this, uh, d uh, but no, I mean, it, uh, this is really just a joke, but I was going to say, is it the Star Wars wipe at the end of, oh. of, uh, being in Russia? Oh God, you depressed <laughs> me even more than, than I was. <laughs> Did John G. Avelson the... just stop watching movies? I don't know. Cause it's like he hasn't seen a movie since 1976. I was like, what the fuck is that Star Wars wipe doing in this movie? It's the only one in there. Well, so... It doesn't make sense. So I noticed that, you know, one of the differences in the last two movies is that they've got a lot more efficient with the, with the opening recap. Mm -hmm. Whereas here we've gone back to the meaty chunk. Which right. tells me that Abelson's approach to sequels is very dated. That he's thinking in late 1970s terms by doing this meaty recap. Um, and later in the movie, you'll realize that it was necessary because, as we've said, it's really the only decent boxing in the movie. Right. Um, and what did I, I'm also starting to realize, because, I mean, we're basically there. You know, we have this first scene. We see we have, a, for whatever reason, we have an obligatory ass shot of Stallone. Uh, in the shower, and then him not able to keep his hands from shaking. So we've got brain damage, finally, well, uh, in earnest. We have brain damage for real now, this... and he just wants to go home. But what I was going to say yeah. was, that, is is what John, is, does John G. Abelson, what does he have to bring to every movie he makes that is a sequel, is a terrible timeline? Because I'm, you know, the the kid having clearly aged by five mm. to six years by the time Rocky got on a plane to come home is so absurd in this movie. How could you start your movie where the last movie ended when your kid is 10 and then now clearly have a 15 year old right. in your film? John G. Avildsen. Yeah. I blame you, sir. 
Right. Because these are the same problems of of the Karate Kid series. Well, I don't... Ralph Macchio is 35, <laughs> passing off as 19. Well, also, I mean, I, we, I think we probably said this in our Karate Kid 2 episode, but this movie begins exactly the same way as that movie does with... Yeah, right. ...with our athlete in the showers. In the shower. Uh, which is my, my first note is, he's back! <laughs> And he, right. but also he's in the showers and he immediately collapses. Yeah. And at this point, I'm like, okay, yeah, we've got to show that there were some physical consequences to what he went through in that fight. That's fine. Mm -hmm. um, and then we get a line which is actually going to resonate through to Creed Two, which is he's quoting he's quoting Mickey, I believe. Well, in his sort of brain damaged babbling, but Rocky says he broke something inside, and I believe he keeps going back to that all the mm -hmm. way through to Creed Two. This idea, like Drago, really is the guy who, you know, made it impossible for me to to function mentally from now on. Yeah, yeah, and my next note is exactly the same: unnecessary timeline problems, five year gap. Making right. the son older, even though it's a different actor, and you just could have cast someone younger. Well, there's some nepotism there, too, because it's yeah. his son. Not only nepotism, but this is our second sequel crossover. <laughs> right. Our second 1990 sequel crossover. <laughs> because here's Sylvester Stallone casting his own son in the role of his on-screen son. Mm-hmm. Just as Francis Ford Coppola in The Godfather Part it's, 3 will cast his three. own daughter, Sophia Coppola, as now, the lead actor's know, daughter. Yeah. But a little bit of a different story there, because we all know that uh, Winona Ryder was going to be in that movie mm -hmm. and then suffered from exhaustion. And well, for yeah, whatever but he reason... He still made the choice that, oh, right. it's, it's exactly the same. He right. can play my exactly. son because he's my son. It's the same... This, it, it's the same uh, bad idea. <laughs> but um, that's not, you know, uh, I I don't want to attack Sofia Coppola and I definitely don't want to attack uh, Cage Stallone because he's, uh, he's rather good in this movie in which there is mm -hmm. not a lot of good performances. I agree. Uh, that was one of my pleasant surprises for this movie. Yeah, I mean, mine, mine too. He wasn't as bad as I remembered or i you know i think i disliked the movie so much that i <laughs> you know projected that upon him as well completely yeah no absolutely not um he's very good and uh he you know he makes lemonade out of what he's given yeah let me ask you this mm -hmm. because we have uh this scene where he's he's home on the plane he's like, where's the kid where's the kid and then the kid's five years older but i'll put that aside for now because then you have the press conference. Yeah. Uh, the press conference is populated by actual press. Right. Playing essentially themselves as actors. How'd that work for you? D does it... Well, I appreciate that degree of realism. But it's uh -huh. all for nothing. Because there is no way that a mere 48 hours after winning the Cold War... <laughs> The press would be on his back. Right? Yeah, he would have a grace exactly. period of at least 48 hours before they're demanding right. another fight from him. He just won the Cold War for America. The, 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 it really struck me because like, I, I, I had these two conflicting ideas in my head about this scene about actual sports press. Mm-hmm essentially playing themselves in a scene and they're all pretty good. Oh yeah. I but mean, yeah. but they're being forced to do stupid shit. <laughs> they really are. And it gets worse. Um, badgering Rocky to respond about it's, it's taking on some guy who, who managed to get the belt. Uh, I don't know how, I mean, I get that Rocky <laughs> gave up the belt, but he gave like, he gave it up like four weeks ago. We had, we had a fight already. Like what happened? Well, the, well, the timeline problem comes into play again because right. we're in 
the world of 90s boxing. Mm -hmm. And it's 1985. Right, exactly. I mean, I don't... I know Don King has been around a lot longer, but this modern idea of him with what is clearly Mike Tyson... Yes. ...is post-1985, right? Or am I... Uh, absolutely. Uh... Yeah, so I. I mean, I kind of I I like the fact that even though the timeline doesn't make sense, they are trying to contemporize it for nineteen ninety. You know that Rich well, Richard like, Gant it, it just, is clearly Don King. Uh, the that guy the music in it, Tyson. the rap montages that they choose to use, dates this movie. In a place that it's not actually in. <laughs> Because, again, it's 1985, or should be yeah. 1985 in this movie. And, you know, th th that was my other pleasant surprise of this movie, was Richard Gant does a better Don King than Don King. Yeah. He's a more convincing Don King than Don King. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Don King. Um, it's just, yeah, it's a great I remember thinking it was a little too... Great, great I, I, performance. I remember thinking at the time it was a little too on the nose. Or it just, I guess it felt heavy-handed... The writing of it, I think the performance. The writing is of excellent. it, but the performance yeah. is um, spot on and great. It really is good. And I, I again, I'll, I'm going to say, which I cannot say for Tommy Morrison. Oh, uh, so <laughs> I like so I like the fact that they give they give him a because this this is something we've kind of forgotten that Rocky has these gaps, these famous like misunderstandings and they gave him a good mm -hmm. one here where he says you know doctors recommend boxers shouldn't fight and he's like yeah i don't think doctors should fight or whatever it is it's it's right but it's like ah oh, that's that's rocky that's good rocky but that's the last time he does anything like that in the movie right so it's pointless um it's just lip service to that idea everything in this movie is lip service and rantlers we, we, that was my first we work so he, we work when he says santa is coming and he yells rantlers <laughs> i'm just like fuck man this fucking movie we, it's it's you know you're in for a bad time when you both have different anecdotes about how terrible this movie is <laughs> <laughs> We're comparing, we're comparing notes on the on the awfulness of this movie. <laughs> oh, shit. It's like I have forgot about that. I didn't even hear that. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Um, this is, well, the other Godfather Part Three crossover for me is when we get back to the Balboa House, and suddenly it's the Corleone compound. Right. If you told me that was stock footage from the Godfather, I'd be like, yeah, sure. It's not the same place we left. And there's right. no robot there, crucially. There's, yeah. There's, there's no robot. and I'm surprised there uh, isn't like an upturned robot in the trash. Mm -hmm. Because that's the message it's sending. Now, okay. Uh, we I think we, we started to talk about this in the last movie. Because we, we talked about the moment where Polly makes good. Oh. And that it would have been nice if it was followed by, by the way, I lost all your money. But. Or not what happen do you at make, all. Well, what do you make of this choice? Specifically. Because to me, like, Polly's a bit of a fool. So they're, I don't know. It seems like, it feel, it just felt like they're throwing the character of Polly under the bus. Mm. This is something that Rocky could have done himself. Well, and later in the movie, he doesn't sign a contract with his new fighter, so he... He makes this... Yeah, exactly. Makes the same mistake. Uh, so, again, it's like everything in this movie, the, the more that they want to return to the uh, to the idea of realism, the further away from reality they get. There is mm -hmm. no conceivable world in which you would put your finances in the hand of, hands of Polly. Right. So I don't buy that. It Well, but they present it as... The lawyer gave this letter to Polly and told him to tell Rocky to sign it. And it's it's a like in in Polly's character arc, it's a misstep. Mm -hmm. Because in the last movie, he's come to you know we've he's grown emotionally. 
He's grown professionally, and this undercuts all of that. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of believable in terms of where he came from that he's the kind of guy who would lose all your money. Yeah. I don't know, though. Even in Rocky 2, he seems like he's pretty good at, like, in the numbers racket. Like, he's he's better... <laughs> you know right. what I mean? Like, he's perfectly good at that. Um... It's just, I mean, it's just, it's engine, it's plot engineering, isn't it? It's like, well, it doesn't and that's need what to I was going to say about the press conference too. Like that's such a plot engineering device because, oh, God, yeah. like, my note here is this man's been retiring since 1979. So, once you've fought the fight of all fights, where you end the Cold War and avenge your friend who died, you can go into the sweet. You know that good night. Like you, you're done with your career. It's like that concept of Chekhov's gun. You know, if you introduce a gun in the first act, it has to go off in the second act. I think if you introduce a plot idea that you have to get Rocky to get back into the ring and he doesn't ever get back into the ring, you failed. Yeah, right. As a dramatist. Yeah. Uh, not to mention where we go in between, which is also nonsensical. Um, yeah, it, I mean. Something that happens, something even stranger that happens, we're vaguely aware that Rocky has brain damage because he's babbling in the shower. Mm -hmm. And when he gets back, he starts saying things like, I'm going to fuck you like a parking meter. And right. Cage Stallone <laughs> says, there's something strange about dad. So half of yeah. it, so I'm thinking, is are they trying to imply that his character has changed because he has brain damage? Oh, absolutely. And how far does that go? They are trying to bring him back. Right! To 1976 to, mental age. To 1976 Rocky, yeah. Exactly. Through the idea of brain damage, which yeah. is offensive in so many ways to people who actually experience <laughs> no. that, to the athletes that go through it. I mean, oh, this movie. It's fucking bad. And it's like, but it's interesting because I actually, you know, overall, I think. This is the idea of Rocky Balboa from now on. Mm -hmm. This brain damage reset, which fits Stallone's later acting style pretty well. And in Rocky Balboa, he makes it all work. Yeah, and the he, template, he does. The, the template he really is set does. here. Yeah. And also, Avildsen, as director, is pushing that, you know, all I want is 76 Rocky again. I don't want this... I don't want any of the fame or celebrity or any of the superhero bit. I don't want any of that. Right. But that's where we are from. But it, it definitely doesn't work in this movie. No. But it will yeah. eventually. And it's what we're left with. And that's not and a that's bad thing. And that's interesting, isn't it? That's isn't not a bad thing if you that... work at it right. But this movie doesn't yeah, exactly. work at it right. And it's the difference between how well Stallone knows the his character. If you're anything like me, you spend the majority of the day wondering whether you want coffee, beer, or wine. Whichever way you fall, Brew Bar has you covered. Located in the heart of 3rd Avenue Village in glorious downtown Chula Vista, California, which is also my neck of the woods, Brew Bar is a coffee shop, bar, and eatery rolled into one delightful package. Tim and Alex run the place, and let me tell you listeners, these guys know their coffee. And after you've been in their company, so will you. They turned me on to pour over, and it's literally all I drink now. If for some crazy reason you don't want to try the best coffee in the world, they've got espresso drinks, all kinds of teas, and even coffee cocktails. You heard me. Coffee tails. And we're just getting started. Bottle service on craft beer and wine, alcoholic and caffeinated potions, an all-day food menu with plenty of vegan options. All served up in an atmosphere hip enough to know you're getting the best quality, but not too hip that you feel the need to drive to 7-Eleven and get a bucket of brown swill. Brew Bar. It's the best place to be for beer, wine, coffee and tea. And if you go, you might even see me. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. Tom and I are here. Looking over our notes and dreading talking about Rocky V, the nineteen ninety film directed by John G. Avildsen. It's just a word document of misery. Yeah, I was just gonna say it's just nothing but pain and misery as I look over my notes. 
<laughs> and I just just to when I when I said to you, do you think that brain damage is the reason Stallone isn't acting like? Rock, Rocky isn't acting like Rocky anymore, or Stallone. Who the fuck cares anymore? Um, <laughs> and I, I was really hoping you were going to say, "Get the fuck out of here! What a stupid idea!" But you actually confirmed that this movie is as stupid as I thought it was. No, so yeah. I feel and, like and, I went you know, to the doctor hoping for a negative and was told I had cancer. Well, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Because <laughs> the thing that. Um... I find remarkable about that is when you asked that question, it I, it deep hooked me into the exact <laughs> feeling I had when I first saw this movie in 1990. I have a literal moment in this movie where I feel sick uh, <laughs> because I know a certain line is coming. What is it? Well, we'll get there. Oh, come on. <laughs> God, don't leave me hanging. Shit. It's the urban blight scene. <laughs> As soon, they're walking, yeah. they're walking um, Rocky Junior to school, and something in my stomach tells me that they're about to say something racist. Yeah, because <laughs> I've seen this movie so many times on rotation in marathons, and this bit for some reason, you know, that happens when you're watching things on a cycle. Mm -hmm. You see one scene over and over again, and as soon as I see them walk. Like on, they're going to the corner, and as soon as I see the corner of that building, my stomach goes, "Racism is coming." <laughs> Shit, and it does. And it does. Yeah, the the movie anyway, meets that expectation. Unfortunately, we're not there yet. We got to talk about fraud, taxes, mortgage. Do we have to talk about Madame Dupont? <laughs> Who's Madame Dupont? Remember, he just goes into his kid's room and he's got that. Oh, for fuck's sake! <laughs> Stop telling me things about this movie that I forgot! <laughs> so, but this is important. This is an important scene because the equivalent scene in Rocky IV is like fun with a robot, fun hijinks with a <laughs> right, robot. Right, exactly. Here, it's a pencil drawing of boobs. Right. This is not family friendly fair anymore. That he's done himself. Yeah. And to me that and the is implication like, that is... is he's probably playing with himself. Yeah. Well looking sure. at that picture. Well it's not it's not like it. it's not like we don't see the picture of the boobs either. Like No, we, yeah. We, we see them. We, so yeah, Exactly. <laughs> uh and to me that you might as well have upturned Seiko in a trash can for all that that scene is saying. Mm-hmm. Um I mean, you know, I think we covered this in the Seiko minisode, and I'm, I'm not going back there, but, you know, when they lose all their money, what happens to Seiko? Where is Seiko? Well, I mean, because he appears to be gone even before they realize they've lost their money. Right. <laughs> you know, Seiko just does not exist. And that's pa the thing Paulie, about this Paulie movie. had Gazzo take care of her. Take, yeah, exactly. Take care of her. <laughs> Which is like another Godfather crossover. Oh. It was an abortion, Michael, an abortion. <laughs> um, anyway, so so the 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 Balboas are losing, have lost their fortune, mm -hmm. and and it's it's explained to you twice because so you have times. all the information you need when when Adrian is yelling at Polly, but then we go to the lawyers. <laughs> Right. Well, we find out that basically any any plot reason how he would be able to get his money back is, is going to be option. gone forever. <laughs> yeah, because exactly. he has a loan sharking criminal record. Mm -hmm. So now his sponsors have left him. This guy just won the Cold War. <laughs> and he's a boxer. And as I understand it, I don't know boxing as well as you, it's full of fucking criminals. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Loan sharking is not a fucking problem. It's, it's the smallest offense of oh. all the offenses. It's just reality stripping. You know, this, like, artificial obstacles put in the character's um, way to undo the last two movies. Right, exactly. None of it makes sense. There's no way... I mean, yeah, of course people lose 
this amount of money and but the idea that there's no way to recoup it when Rocky has just gone to Russia and won the Cold War and is now literally probably the most famous man in the world is absurd. The number of the number of product placements despite his checkered past that would right. come through uh would be astonishing. It's it's nonsense. <laughs> And then it's a, uh, and then um, the other side of it is just we just take the fun out of everything. So we we see him go to the hospital and get his brain scanned, and right, you know, the scene plays out how it would really play out in a doctor's office. But in the back of my mind, I'm like, wow, medical technology was way cooler in the last movie. Yeah, exactly. And and less pessimistic. Mm-hmm. And then the movie completely hamstrings itself and for future movies by saying the effects are irreversible. First of all, you think which well, which is not the, true. What's the rest of the movie going to be yeah. about? No, it's not true. <laughs> it's like, well, first of all, what's the rest of the movie going to be about? And the movie never provides an answer to that. Um, but also, what are future movies going to be about? Uh, so you have to wreck. You know, you you you're instantly creating a, a retcon opportunity. Right. Yeah. Um, and I think, I, I guess for me, like one of the major problems of this movie is that, you know, you can, you can try and engineer realism as much as possible, but if you fail to control the acting of your principles, it's pointless. What's the point? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And Avildsen lets, um, lets Stallone and Shire just that their acting just gets out of control. Mm-hmm. He needs to rein it in if this is to feel authentic in any way. Are you thinking of that street fight scene? I mean, That's not a... the not their fight. I mean, <laughs> not the end fight. I mean, their <laughs> yeah. argument in the street. Right. Exactly. Yeah, I'm thinking of that. And just in even in this scene in the lawyer's office, it's like everyone is twice as mannered as they need to be. Mm-hmm. And this, to me, that's a director's job. It's for Avelson to go and go, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hey, rain it in, rain it in. Remember what we're doing here. This is a scene about him losing his livelihood. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, I guess in that context, it doesn't surprise me what you said about Stallone doing it for greed. Because his heart's clearly not in this and neither is his acting ability. That's it. Yeah, you're right. Um. Because there's lots of arguments that you hear about, you know, you, you hear a lot of people shit on him as though he's not a good actor. Right. But he certainly can be. He certainly can be, and pretty much every other movie in this franchise demonstrates that, but this one is closer to the stereotype mm-hmm. of Stallone as an actor, which is kind of missing every mark emotionally. Yeah. And, like, doing everything twice as big as it needs to be. Um, and just can't to kinda, disagree with that. Just to kind of like consolidate the sadness, we get a sad montage <laughs> <laughs> with a sad version of the theme. Yeah, <laughs> it's like I was thinking. Now this, you know, this is the reverse of how montage usually works in this franchise, right? Mm-hmm. It's just like it's supposed to be uplifting. When we get a montage. But instead you get... Uh. <laughs> I'm all for sequel inversions, but if you suffer Clearly. more because... Uh, yeah. If you suffer more because of the inversion, don't invert it. Right. And that is every inversion in this movie is... Yeah, but we when, when you do that, we all lose. <laughs> I think it's funny too, because I mean, oh man, this movie's so bad that like I'm gonna bring up things that are bad in it that make me just sad to have to talk about. Yeah, because everything is, and I like you. I think that this lies at the feet of John G. Avildsen too. Definitely, um, because he didn't know clearly how to fix it. Um, because the things like 
the things that where this movie struggles, let's face it, this movie struggles from beginning to end, but yeah, it does. Um, the child romance and <laughs> the <laughs> the the home team split up. Um, oh, is like an after school special. Like it's after school special level of writing and directing and acting. Absolutely. Of the the hurt and pain of Sage Stallone. Right. As Rocky Jr. Um is just absurd. Yeah. And it is absurd. And it it, it it's it's interesting because I think I said in a previous episode I think this is this is the direction that the franchise should have gone in. But the choices they make within that mm-hmm. are more artificial than you would get if we, you know, carried on from where Rocky IV left off and it got more and more absurd. You could come up with nothing as crazy as they do in this movie. Mm-hmm. But because it's tied up with this ethos of back to basics, return to origins, return to realism... It doesn't mean it doesn't mean it's any less artificial. Yeah, it's more artificial because you're artificially putting that on the character. Putting it on the character. Yeah, right. This, I mean, again, it, you know, and we'll talk about Rocky Balboa another time. But Rocky Balboa manages to figure out how to do these storylines well. But as it appears in this movie, there is not there is no motivation behind Rocky. Um, becoming estranged from Rocky Jr. Right. It comes out of left field. It makes no sense based on what we know about both of them. Because his be, he's been a fighter this kid's whole life. And right. even even though he has, had, as we've pointed out many times, he has had to um, leave his son to go train right. uh, for most of his son's life. Yeah. They always preface that with a scene with the son. Yeah. Where they talk about what he has to do and why he's doing it and why it's important, and I love you. Yeah. And then the second he becomes Mickey, he's like, "Who are you?" Yeah. I got yeah, exactly. things to do. The idea that he would throw it away for this Carney is just like <laughs> yes. it, it, it's absurd. We'll, we'll Tommy look. the Machine Gun Morrison, who I I <laughs> who, who I wanted to I wanted him to be from Montana. So that he could be called the mullet from Montana. <laughs> um, you mentioned Mickey. He's at the end of Act One. Yeah, the the ghost of Mickey. Yeah, uh, I'm I'm actually fine with this. Surprisingly, it seems like it would be the worst part of the movie, but uh, it works. I mean, you get Burgess Meredith. Obviously, that's good. Yeah, um, it's a flashback. So okay. It's sentimental. We're allowed to be sentimental about these guys. But again, it's like they're going back to the first fight. So Stallone can't even play himself in the flashback because he looks so drastically different. Yeah. And the fact that he, that Mickey said this at this time, rewrites history in an unsatisfactory way. Right. There was no sense that they had this conversation. Yeah. Until now. Um, so I'm grateful for it. <laughs> but it's not what it could be. And doing it in black and white is silly. Yeah. Uh, but not as silly as this new rap soundtrack we have. So, I mean... Which I've, is supposed I've... to bring us back to the streets. Yeah. And up to date. Remember, we are still in 1985. Um, but we're not. <laughs> but we're not. Because we're clearly decided to use rap for all montages in this movie and date this movie in 1990. Yeah. It's, 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 I mean, it's also, it's also kind of disingenuous because you, you basically you're using that to give you a flavor of the urban. And we immediately go into mm-hmm. what seems to be an all-white neighborhood. <laughs> right. So, like, is this the music that these people would be listening to? No. You just wanted to you wanted to give the idea of the streets, yeah. By you by racistly using rap by, music. exactly, um, and we're not in the nineties yet. You just you just worry that 
you know, I don't, you don't know if it's John G. Avildsen or some producer or something. It's like, so uh, like, let's put something urban in there. Yeah. This is what the black people listen to, Completely. right? Completely. I bet and they have that like, conversation. Ugh. Um, uh, and at this point, uh, Rocky, Rocky and Adrian put their Rocky and Adrian costumes back on. <laughs> right? Talk about realism. Yeah. It's like they were going out for Halloween. <laughs> and you know it's like it's it it's as it's as on the nose as it gets you know we're back to the original flavor characters but it really does feel like you know it feels like those later indiana jones sequels where he's putting on an indiana jones costume mm -hmm. like raid raiders and temple those are his clothes yeah from then onwards he's putting on an indiana jones costume and that's mm -hmm. what it feels like here yeah because these guys haven't worn these clothes for a fucking decade <laughs> Right. And just because they don't have money doesn't mean they have to fucking dress like this. Yeah. Again, these we we want we would we're, we're using poverty as a shortcut to realism, but we're also making light of poverty. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. Hate it. Well, and also, you know, <laughs> he walks into that gym for the dream sequence. <laughs> the dream sequence, Jim. <laughs> I'm gonna go with the dream sequence, Jim. I'll be right back. <laughs> and that gym is in shambles. Cut to the next scene. It's don't, a thriving local don't, business. Don't, don't throw more plot holes at me, please. <laughs> I so, you're so right. God damn yeah. it. But that's it. It's like it's just a different kind of implausibility. Just yeah. because you're doing it in a realist framework, ostensibly doesn't mean that it's any more plausible. But that's, that's, the, that's the trick, isn't it? Like, as implausible as Rocky IV is, it's all plausible within the way yeah, he made Rocky right. IV. That's, that's it. You've solved it. It's yeah. like, it makes sense within, within its own framework. And yeah. this movie... This, movie's this framework, movie creates a framework that yeah. all of this goes against. Completely. Yeah. Um... And it's not to say that there isn't potential in in the way the story's going. Like I like the idea of like, oh, Rocky and Paulie are back on the streets, but now they've got a sil. I mean, it does sound a little Three's Company when you say it out loud, but they have a silver spoon child to teach the ways of the streets. It's like yeah. that's potentially interesting, but it it goes down that after school special route that you talked about that um that fucks it all up. Uh. And yeah, we have another game of musical chairs here. Mm -hmm. So Rocky becomes Mickey. Yes. To, to an entirely new character. Who's... Uh, Tommy, Tommy Gunn. Yeah. And Connie's back to, def to a defense role of just standing around going, well, I don't know, what's her objection? <laughs> what? I just, what's her <laughs> objection here? I actually don't know. Because she's... She's not objective. Oh yeah, because they're. I just like that uh, you called her Connie. Oh, I called her. Con Did I call? Her <laughs> Adrian, I've got Connie written down here. Um, so that's hilarious. That's fucking great. Uh, so, um, Adrian. Yes. She's a so they so still so basically Richard. Well, it's Jan all wrapped keeps under turning the, up the... in a limousine, yeah. going, "I'm going to get you to fight," right? Yeah. And so that's what she's objecting to. That's and it's all wrapped up under the guise of, listen, he's brain damaged now. <laughs> like he can't possibly fight. It's turned him into a bad actor. Yeah. Uh, apparently. I'm back to Hawk and Turtles. And you know, for for a movie that's supp supposedly trying to be gritty realism, like it, the dialogue is so on the there's, nose. Yeah, there's no sense of that in this movie. When Richard Gant, who is also called Duke, confusingly in this movie. Yeah, strangely. Uh, you know, he says, oh, he's the great white hope. And he just lists what Rocky is allegorically. And I'm like, no, 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 I don't want to hear that in words. Right. <laughs> I just want to think it. Yeah. And, I mean, his, uh, he has got this Bond, le Bond villain level plan. Oh, yeah. To ensnare Rocky in this sting operation <laughs> which apparently he came up with before he even met tommy gunn which i don't know how is possible mm -hmm. he says all i need is a hook 
but it's but it still doesn't get Rocky in the ring. No, it never does. <laughs> Which so, what Which was is the why <laughs> one of the many reasons why this movie sucks. Hmm. Uh, I don't know. Let's take another break, maybe. Yeah, I think they. Yeah, go on. Yeah, let's let's uh, let's siphon off the misery a little bit. Yeah, well, we'll, we'll, (laughs) does the coronavirus have you feeling oogie? Have you been sitting on your couch for weeks? Nay, have you been sitting on there for months? Well, it's time for you to get back in shape. Check out Two A T Fitness. You can find them on Instagram. You can find them on Facebook. To a T Fitness was started by Tina Bernard. She is ready and raring to go to help you get back into the shape you want to get into. They've got all kinds of classes. They've got outdoor in-person classes. They've got online classes if that's what you prefer. Ladies and gentlemen, it's time to get back in shape. You're going to find a variety of exercises. You're going to have strength training, cardio, weightlifting, even fun five-minute burnouts that will push you to your limits. So get off the couch, get into shape. Go ahead and check out Tua T Fitness. Tina Bernard has got you for all your needs. I know her personally. She's fantastic. You're not going to meet a better person to help you become the new you. Check it out. And we're back, ladies and gentlemen. Tom and I are here trying to finish up Rocky Five. The 19- this is supposed to be finishing up? <laughs> like, there's a lot of film left. The 1990 disappointment. <laughs> All right, Tom, we got to, so we got to, yeah. That's not I, Godfather I, 3. Yeah. <laughs> As we were leaving, we were getting into Tommy the Gun Morrison. Uh, yeah, and also at this point, Rocky Jr. is going to school. He's getting beaten up by kids. Yeah. They, you have yourself the some... B story. That's the other thing about this movie is it presents itself um, like a sitcom. Is that the B story? Yeah, like A story, B story, C story. I think Tommy Gunn's the B story. I know it shouldn't be. But I think of it as the B story. I think of this as the A story. Maybe because it's it's better acted. I don't know. Well, I guess because I think of... You're right. Either way, it's a problem that yeah, neither of exactly. us can answer that question, right? <laughs> like when you ha- when you when you have <laughs> if your A story is uh, whether or not your son can get the girl and beat up other boys, it's a bit more interesting than what's going on with Tommy Gunn. You're not wrong about that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a low bar, though, isn't it? Yeah. Um, but I also have notes here, like, because at one you keep seeing more rap montages, because he's starting to train Tommy the Gun Morrison, oh, and yeah. he's winning fights. Did, what, what did you describe the montages as? Um, did you say crap? Rap. Oh. 90s rap movies. Bo- bo- again, both work. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> crap rap montages. 90s crap rap movie montages. And yeah. he like at one point it says he's twenty two and zero. Do you have any idea how many years he it would be for him to be twenty two right. and zero? So, I, I I haven't rewatched Rocky since we started doing. I this. haven't I will either. Afterwards, I never got the sense in Rocky that that Rocky's rise, that Rocky's shot at the heavyweight title was anything more than a fluke. Right. Right. It was like a once in a lifetime opportunity handed to him on a plate. In this movie, <laughs> here I get the sense that we're supposed to think that this is like a real, like this is how a boxer's career actually goes. Yeah. And like, what you got to do is fight twenty-two small fights in Philadelphia, <gasps> and then you clamor to take on the champ. And when we get to the Christmas bit, <laughs> which is their first Christmas in that house, and they say that, and I wish they hadn't said that because I could at least entertain in my head canon that this was a few Christmases down the line. Right. It's been six fucking months. <laughs> and he is now ready to take on the champion. Yeah. I mean, why are we taking these shortcuts? In this kind of a movie. Why can't John G. Avildsen deal with time correctly? 
God damn it. Chu and I, this... Chu and I on the other podcast, we talk about movie jail for directors. Like, yeah. When we do a movie and that's the last movie you've heard of them doing, we're like, yeah, that guy's still in Hollywood jail. Well. This is Hollywood jail level. Oh, yeah. Failings. I think Avildsen's been in a different kind of Hollywood jail where he has no access to Hollywood movies. <laughs> Literally does not know what has happened since the late 70s in cinema. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> On the upside, not that there's many in this movies, but. Even even though Paulie as a character is dead in the water, yeah, he's still got some funny shit in this movie. Yeah, there's that amazing, oh, amazing, in amazing, context, amazing <laughs> scene where he's selling, uh, he's selling the crockery from the house as Rocky merchandise, which right? I think is, is very funny, and it's a it's an actual it's like a nice a nice representation of where we've been. And of course, he's going to come down up. as Santa Claus. Yeah, he, <laughs> maybe he not has quite that as good a bit. No, that scene should have been I, I, throughout that Santa Claus scene. I'm like, oh, this should have been three times as funny as it is. Yeah, right. And all you have to do is act it properly, and it would have been. <laughs> and you get it hitting all the wrong acting notes, yeah. one after the other. I thought when when Tommy comes round to their um, when Tommy comes over for dinner. And starts talking about his like dysfunctional family history. I know, I'm like, right? I'm like, oh, there's a John G. Avildsen character exactly. right there. <laughs> Why did you make a movie just about him? Yeah, exactly. This, it, that's it, isn't it? It's like, well, and this, and then, and the Christmas and then, scene oh. leads to their fight out on the street, right? No, we're nowhere near that, Mike. Oh, you're right. <laughs> God damn this movie. You, you're willing this movie to be shorter than it is. <laughs> you're right. I forgot. Um, that's after Tommy leaves him. That's I do, after Tommy. Because uh, I do have a note here that says Tommy turned into a dick pretty quick. Oh, yeah. There's nothing in his characters that we see that suggests he will go that way. Yeah. Unless he gets knocked around the head too and gets brain damage, mm -hmm. which apparently is at the root of everyone's character now. <laughs> Um, yeah, it's, oh, it, and then Avildsen does, like, pure sort of director ego things, like, he, they go back to the fight hall from the original movie with the Jesus painting, and he's like, look at all these great shots I came up with mm -hmm. since 1976. Yeah. Um. Well, and there was, that was even a fight he had with the director of photography. <laughs> you surprised me. Uh, what was it, the guy... I can't. Oh, now I want to look it up. <laughs> yeah, go ahead and look it up. Um, the other, the other, the other thing. I mean, this is going back a bit, but the other note I had about a similar move from Avildsen is that we know that his big objection to directing Rocky Two is he didn't want to have to do the scenes where Rocky films commercials and where he's dealing with fame. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting that in the storyline to this, those are two things that are made a narrative impossibility. Right. Very early on. But I, I mean, we spoke to that, right? Because um, you had mentioned it earlier. A little bit. I and it was just like, it was clear that John G. Avildsen wanted to put in the movie, we're not doing that shit. And here's why. Right. Here's a narrative in the reason In the why. most implausible way possible. Yeah. Uh, again, we, I mean, you kind of had this in the last movie as well. It's not just a Rocky V thing, but we the characters flip-flop again. Mm -hmm. Rocky is now telling... Tommy Gunn, he needs his performance needs to be bigger when that's exactly what he criticized Creed for in the last movie. Yeah. But okay, he's got brain damage. Whatever. <laughs> I've got I've got the quote here. Go ahead. John G. Avildsen felt the cinematographer Stephen Poster was overlighting many scenes. He told Poster he wanted the film to look more like Rocky. Oh. In which James Crabb often used a single spotlight to light an entire scene. And we're talking a no direct reference money. to that first fight that we see Rocky have. And he uses that same ring. Oh. And such as the opening boxing match. And Poster told Avildsen that the original film looked like a cheap documentary. And Avildsen smiled and said, exactly. <laughs> 
That anecdote says it all. Doesn't it? And then some. <laughs> How great is that? I want it to be under... It's like hashtag 70s problems. <laughs> I want it to be underlit and look like a 70s movie. <laughs> like a cheap documentary. Oh, that's... That's really interesting. But I find it interesting that the cinematographer clearly knew, you know, that's not the movie you're making, right? <laughs> there's there's also, there's a really strong smell in this movie of, because Avildsen is, you know, trying to recapture that original flavor Rocky, just shitting over the iconography. <laughs> <laughs> like, the scene that really makes me think of that, I, I, I don't, I, it makes me sad just to say it. When we do the the steps, yeah, right. When 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 it's Rocky and Tommy going Together. up the steps, right. This has always been Rocky's solo moment. I mean, I know there are a bunch of kids there, but whatever. That was kids from Fame. Fine. Yeah. But now some hicks doing circus tricks, <laughs> fucking cartwheeling up there. I mean, that's literally like smearing shit all over the frame, isn't it? <laughs> Not it's earned. Like, it's like fucking inserting Jar Jar Binks in there would be less <laughs> offensive. Misa run the steps? <laughs> <laughs> oh, God. Uh. It's it's interesting as well. Like you said, I think you said after school special. I don't even I don't think there's any after school special that would be as irresponsible as saying the thing you've got to do. <laughs> to uh, to be a to be a better person is to beat up your fr beat up your bullies yeah and then make them your friends <laughs> no no that's, that's not how it goes that's the way it goes apparently to in impress a girl yeah right who thinks you have a a good butt for an Italian because as we all know from our our days of being bullied when we were kids. Once you beat the shit out of your bully, they love you. A putty you. in your hands. <laughs> um, I also liked it that, uh, like one of the one of one of the montages, uh, we see Adrian, who is back working at the pet shop because you know, of course, she is. Mm -hmm. uh, um, we like stop for a moment in the montage to watch her like clear up some bird shit with a newspaper. Yeah. <laughs> it's like. Wow, that says it all about this movie, doesn't it? It's like, that's what we're stopping for, really? And that's what this movie thinks about Montana. Well, and also... Like, this is perfectly fine to put can in Can we there. give a little bit more credit to the woman Adrian had become? She probably could have been in yeah. commercials. <laughs> <laughs> it, I, don't think, yeah. I don't think she'd reached a point in the her wife life of the where the only the place she could have gone to get a job was back at the pet shop. The first owner of a domestic robot. That's a story <laughs> yes, she there, could there charge for. Oh, just... I mean, that's that's the, you know, that's the thin end of the wedge when it comes to how offensive this movie is to women. Because... Yeah. Tommy's... Tommy's little lady friend. Mall. Yeah. That he's given by... Richard Gann. She's is... getting she's getting trash talk from fucking reporters. <laughs> that that is so. I mean, like that. That's what I mean about like. What's the point of casting the real people in the roles of like press if they say things that the press would, would never, never say? say. <laughs> like, hey, your woman's a piece of trash. <laughs> I'm a reporter. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Any you could have given anyone that line. I'm a reporter from the reporting place. Why don't you get your whore girlfriend to do? <laughs> oh, jeez. Uh, I don't remember the exact line, but I think it, it, in a way, like I really like Richard Gant's performance. I think Cage Stallone is fine. Uh, Not Cage, Sage. Oh, have I been saying Cage? I think so. Yeah. Ket Connie's Connie's terrible. Connie's awful. Rambo is awful. <laughs> and uh <laughs> It's kind I I I think you know there are moments with Sage though where he's like really trying to put on the tough thing where I yeah. like Well, yeah, but that's part of his story as well. I guess, but I forgive him for that. Um we haven't forgot Paul, he's a virulent racist, at least. Because no. when Richard Gant comes by, he says, guess who's coming to dinner? Yeah, I know. 
so we've not lost a sense of who Paulie is. Unfortunately, we're going like again. We're resetting to back. I did not remember that line though. Like I, my, like my mouth fell. Like it shouldn't because he's Paulie. Yeah. But I just remember thinking, oh, for fucking fuck sake. <laughs> Oh, so, but let's yeah. talk about, you know, the scene where they actually do fight. So Tommy's Tommy's basically saying, I'm going to kick you to the curb so I can get my chance to be champion of the world. And he's chasing after him. And then, and then she chases after him. Connie chases after Rambo. And they have this argument in the streets. Did you notice that... Are you saying Rambo seriously now? Or? No. Okay. <laughs> but... Demolition Man is yeah, fighting with exactly with uh, Art Carney, <laughs> but he has this moment where he's yelling at Adrian while he's trying to keep his coat on. Mm. Did you notice him struggling to keep his coat on during yeah, this argument? Yeah, it's, it's it's a terrible. It's a terror. It should be a real showcase for them. It's it shot should be so the staircase poorly. Scene. It should be yeah. the beach scene for you. But it's weird, even weirder than that. And again, the reason I keep writing Connie is because she's saying things like, Racky, you're losing your family. Mm -hmm. It's like, stop saying iconic Godfather lines yeah, right. when you're not Connie <laughs> Corleone. Know, right? um, and this, what, this is my other huge problem with how of the characterization of Rocky in this is that he tells bad dad jokes mm -hmm. instead of making bad gaffes. And that, to me, is a complete misunderstanding of the humor of the character. Yeah, the idea that he thinks he's funny or he's trying to be funny is is just wrong. Right. It's a small thing. He's funny but on it's accident. A big deal. <laughs> yeah, he's funny by accident. And this movie's forgotten that. Yeah, and they've forgotten. This a lot movie's of things, forgotten everything. Let's face it. It's, for, it's, it's forgotten. Uh, yeah. Um, he's a comic character, not a comedian, basically. Right. Uh. And then there's this basically the the normal stuff that happens in a Rocky movie happens without Rocky, because mm -hmm. Tommy Tommy wins the the title, right? He does, While but Rocky everybody's hold, still mad at him. He's nobody likes that he's he's won the title because they're telling Rocky's him he's just a robot of Rocky. The match on TV. Yeah. Uh, again, an inversion that we don't want or need. Mm -hmm. Um, so like, it's not even like I, you could just about get away with this if Rocky was Mickey, right? Like in Creed, for instance, these two perfectly successful movies yes, exactly. that, that where Rocky does not fight, but he is crucial to being in the to ring. Being, right. Now the story has taken him out of the ring. He's not even Rocky. He's not even Tommy Gunn's manager anymore because Gant's stolen him away. Right. Cause he, cause Rocky learned no lessons. Cause Requiem for a Dream has stolen him away, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> and, uh, so, so there's a there's an A story, a B story, and then there's a there's a another movie <laughs> right. that's happening yeah. in parallel, yeah. um, and. Well, I mean, and that whole fight—it's it, it goes it's, again. Saying, it's one but of those. We need to say it. There is no boxing in this movie, right? And but even during that fight, it's like <laughs> they're trying to set up this this idea of Rocky has instilled all the Rocky things into Tommy, but it's so heavy-handed. Tommy is hitting whatever the guy's name is. What's the guy? <laughs> Um, who's the guy he fights? Uh, Mike Tyson. Yeah, may as well be. <laughs> but whoever he fights for the belt, he's hitting him exactly as Rocky's hitting the the bag. Mm. Which is startling, Paulie and, <laughs> and uh, uh, Adrian. And his... He's made up with yeah. the sun by this time, right? I'm not sure. It takes it basically. It takes Paulie telling him that he has no class 
which right. I mean, if that what you have to if do, you in hear life that so from Polly to get that you from Polly, you know you, you're at the bottom of the barrel <laughs> yeah. and you need to change things. I gotta make some changes. It's kind of funny to like so. Ba- it's weird because if you compare this to the rest of the movies, the rest of the movies they all have an uh, like a an individual psycho crisis. For the so in four it's. We don't want to become regular people. In three, it's you became civilized. Mm-hmm. Two, it's I don't know what it is, but there's something. There's like a specific psycho crisis yeah. that the whole movie's about. And here we have to wait until about three quarters of the way through the movie before we get to it, mm-hmm. which is that he's really a street fighter. Yeah, which is also not true. Yeah, because <laughs> even when he was a street fighter, he wasn't a street tough. He wasn't like a tough guy. Even when he was a gangster, he well, wasn't. Well, and that's tough. the thing that. You know, first of, all, first of all, Tommy wins his fight and then that night challenges Rocky to a fight. So he's, I mean, I get that he won the fight fairly handily, but you still just performed for the world championship of boxing, which also, by the way, apparently took place in Philadelphia because that's the other thing that the other movies do well. Like this fight's in... Uh, you know, Madison Square Garden, this fight, mm. yeah, it's in Philadelphia, but that's because that's where Creed wants to beat him. This this fight's in Las Vegas. I suppose you could Vegas. say because Gant's baiting Rocky. Maybe. <laughs> oh, maybe that's But by this count. time, he's already stolen away Rocky's protege, so he's, you know... He might not, but, he might not have set out, got what he set out to do, but he did one, you know... But don't, don't you think, if this movie wanted to be about street fighting that you would have introduced this idea earlier than the end of the movie than the end of the movie of course but and the, even, but even to your at point that about point, him being like a street tough and he's always been a street fighter the thing that like is remarkable so tommy wins his fight and goes to a bar and challenges him that night right. you yeah. ever it, like it didn't dawn on me until this moment because like rocky says no, thank you. I just want good things for you. And he turns around and he starts talking shit to him. And Polly's like, fucking take care of this kid. And he's like, it's okay, Polly. The number of mm-hmm. times somebody, including Polly, is exhibiting terrible behavior and Rocky Balboa turns the other cheek always and says, it's okay. Or, yeah. come on, Polly. <laughs> he is the nicest person ever right until he steps into the ring and so yeah this yeah, idea it's... that he's mm-hmm. this born and bred street fighter nonsense grains against that it's so stupid completely you're 100 percent right and yeah and that's in addition to the fact that this movie promises that it will end with a with a ring fight and ends in a street fight <laughs> yeah and that comes totally out of left field. And he, he, even, you know, even if you ask Stallone about it retrospectively, you say, oh, this movie's about going back to the streets and fighting mm-hmm. on the streets. I'm like, yeah, well, no, 10 minutes of this movie's about that. The rest of it's non, non, nothing to do with that. <laughs> exactly. And even then, Richard Gant is shouting, in the ring, in the ring. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like, it's like, if you are going to, first of all, you've introduced this concept too late <laughs> and do- mentioning the fucking ring. Because that's just reminding me that there's not a fucking boxing match right. now. My it's ring's just, outside. Oh, it, I mean, and that, you can see they're so uneasy about this, this street fight. Yeah, they have no, no I know. No idea what to do with it. They bring camp television cameras. It's broadcast on TV, so it's kind of like a real fight, but not. We get flashbacks to Drago in Rocky's brain right. as he's hitting. Let me tell you what uh, doesn't happen in a street fight. When you're <laughs> when you're in a street fight and you're on the ground, the other guy doesn't give you enough time to imagine your former boxing trainer to get you pumped up to get back up. And anyway, he's over at the dream sequence gym. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's filmed in such a disorienting way. It's actually also important I have notes to watch here. for the first time. I have notes here. Extreme close-ups, slow motion, slow push-ins. The directing style, not just of that scene, but this whole movie is a fucking mess. But you expect even in the worst Rocky movie, for them to come through for the fight scene. 
Yeah, right. And this is a spectacular misfire. Yeah, big time. We've seen nothing but competency in the way that they've done boxing choreography. Just because he's so great, just be, just because Burgess Meredith is Burgess Meredith, the only thing I like is him saying, I didn't hear no bell. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you didn't hear a bell but because the, you're out in the street. But exactly. That was the horn of the bus <laughs> waiting for you to get out of the exactly. way. Exactly. And then juxtapose that with this sort of um you know, the sound of the music starting, but then the the faded image of Rocky rising mm. in camera like close up. It's just it ugh. If you if you were going to like I I feel like June June Diane Raphael on on how did this get made? What is a street fighter? <laughs> um, because I feel like if you're gonna if you know if, you've already blown it because you you're making a movie about street fighting and you've introduced the concept ten minutes before the end. Okay, you've already blown it. Yeah. But now that you've blown it, why don't we have like something that feels like it's a street fight? Mm -hmm. But we have the opposite of that. It actually feels like they're reaching for that. The Vegas scene from Rocky IV, when that guy says, only in America, yeah. like, it's like, no, 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 nothing like this ever happens in America, <laughs> right? It's not, not ever. Laugh, it's not well, lovably absurd. Yeah. Not, it's to, just not to regular Americans. It's just like, and then. But I do I like mean, Richard Grant, like the one line that actually really, uh, the like the first time they did it. Yeah. The first time. They did it. Richard Grant really made me laugh when he just put his hands up. He's like, touch me and I'll sue. Hmm. That made me laugh. The follow-up is not as successful. No. And then they fucking Because it up. makes light of everything he's gone through in this movie. Yeah. Turns his poverty into a punchline. Into line. a punchline. And then... So, <laughs> th 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 that's such an important point, too, because when you're trying to bring your movie back to gritty reality, mm -hmm. and then you end your movie on a punchline about your gritty reality mm -hmm. and turn it into a joke you've turned your movie into a joke that's that's absolutely right and also you know i want to add to the pantheon of lines lines from movies that tell you you're in a bad movie <laughs> specifically a bad late sequel mm -hmm. i love it when he does that <laughs> If you hear that in a movie, you're in trouble. Right. <laughs> That's what you say when everyone's been out of ideas for a long time. Actually, only in America's pretty pretty close. Uh -huh. If you're saying that in a movie, something's gone wrong too. And then, of course, now he's running There's up. There's no winners because it's not a fight. There's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> I mean, there are no winners. Not, not even a street fight. Really, but now we have Rocky running up the steps with who he's who he was supposed to be running up the steps with all along. The person he was ignoring, his son, mm -hmm. followed by the classic Stallone. Hey, this is this is the last time we're doing this. We gotta have we gotta have fucking clips of every Fifth movie. movie I need, so we gotta end. It I need with pictures. A <laughs> I gotta say, like I, I will say, as far as this movie goes, the final scene's pretty good. I don't mind. Him and his son at the top of the steps. No, I don't either. Feels like it that like when I'm trying to think. You have a fairly about decent movie, joke of uh, I've been running up these steps a long time. I never knew there were valuable paintings in this place. Yeah, which is which feels more like something like looking forward to Rocky Balboa, where it's like he he's going to enter a different part of society from Rocky and the, yeah. their, their estrangement comes through that. So that, that leads into that class nicely. Yeah, you, like you say, the jokes are pretty good. They've got a little bit of a twist. Mm -hmm. The father-son stuff, which generally, apart from the weird turn it took in this movie, works pretty well in this franchise, yeah. usually. Um, and then, you know, we're <laughs> we're back in a re we're back in recap. Oh, yeah. Um, recapping the whole series, because... It's just something Stallone likes to do after five movies. Feels he um, must. Somewhat undermined by two substantial recap sequences we've already had in the movie. I know. And we also did one, a lengthy one, in the middle of the last movie. My question is, who needs reminding and of what? <laughs> At this point. At this point. We, 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 
we we're all caught up. <laughs> you and you've gone out you of your way of... to show us this these movies many tiny many times. What do you think of uh, a measure of a man by Elton John? Just, yeah, awful, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, just like one of the worst songs in the series. Doesn't work. And again, the lyrics like like that Survivor Rocky Four song. The lyrics are kind of mm-hmm. right, fit, yeah, fit what happens in, in the, the movie. movie, right? But they're all about basically taken together. Those lyrics are like, we shouldn't be making Rocky movies anymore. <laughs> we should have quit. This guy's had his day, yeah. right? That's what it's all about. Yeah. So it kind of it, it's yeah, and nothing against Elton John, but. Not one of his finest songs. No, because um, big fan, but and MC Hammer's on this soundtrack too. I know these guys barely make a dent in the movie compared to the last movie. Oh yeah, but those are two big names. Those mean, are like, two huge, huge names. names who are. But again, like that that last movie, every song he chooses is hammer right on the head of that nail. Yeah, it's perfect, and here it's. Yeah, here you have to be told that. I mean, I, I for for a while I thought the Elton John was Frank Stallone mm-hmm. <laughs> until I checked. Right. Until I saw it, I was like, oh, okay, Elton John. <laughs> if you're getting mistaken for Frank Stallone, you've the maybe songs on this one is like when you look camera. down at the piece of wood and there's like 43 nails in it and they're all bent and fucking yep. fucked up and knocked sideways into the wood. Another great political irony in the credits. Thanking the Soviet government for the use of their jets. I saw that. In the po- like, it reminds us that we're in the post Cold War era. Mm-hmm. In 1990, but also, I hope the same people who gave them permission haven't seen Rocky Four. Right, exactly. That's because they made will quickly me think withdraw about. that yeah. permission. <laughs> it also there's also lists that the um, the clip assembly is done by the Cinema Research Corporation. I didn't they notice. Must, That's funny. They must know they're in for a hefty payday when a new Rocky film comes around. I know. <laughs> they must await the news in variety with bated breath. Huzzah! <laughs> I just, I, I, and you know, just a couple, a couple of notes about how this movie ends, including, st- we're in the credits, by mm-hmm. the way. It, difficult to tell here because we're recapping. We include, including the movie we've just seen in a series recap montage, is one mistake Stallone cannot unlearn. Go. No, that's it. He Like, including the movie in the series recap. Oh, oh okay, okay, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. No, it's fine, yeah. <laughs> um, He's still making that mistake today. Absolutely. Uh, and then the movie ends on a still of the last image of the movie, which turns into a still of that image from the same movie. <laughs> this is an abor- abororoboros of a movie. It literally eats itself. <laughs> I'm serious. I'm, like that, I mean, I was trying to figure out, like, filmically, what is going on here? Where does the still end oh, and the movie begin? Great. So, and that's... That's all I have, and <laughs> and I and I've said too much. Yeah, that uh... <laughs> it's a real centipede of a movie. It's just, yeah, or uh... a human centipede, I should say. <laughs> it's very much a human yeah. centipede, and and we 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 got the we uh, we got an ass. <laughs> You got an ass in our face. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you have something to add to the Rocky Five conversation, we need to know. Yeah. Send us uh, an email to everything sequel at gmail.com. Find us on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Oh, uh, what a disappointment. Mm-hmm. For Tom Stewart of Lonesome Whistle Productions, I am Michael Schantz of the How Dare You Awards. On to greener pastures. Rocky Balboa coming up next. Say goodbye to the good people, Tom. My ring's outside. <laughs>
Excellent. Some unintentionally hilarious dialogue there. Love it. As Stallone loses control of the comedy. <laughs> All right.